designed its custom Bluetooth profile. Um, he's got 30 plus years experience, so please welcome Martin to the stage. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that lovely warm welcome. Yes, 30 years, I'm incredibly old. Now, I hate to talk about Bluetooth. Bluetooth has been around for a long time. It's actually 20 years old this year, which is quite remarkable uh, in itself because technologies come and go, as you're aware. I could talk for a long time about why I think it's still here and thriving in the way that it is. Um, but one of the key reasons, I think, is that there are APIs for Bluetooth from every significant developer platform on the planet except perhaps for one, perhaps the most important one of all. So I'll come on to that shortly. By way of context, be aware, though, that in the year 2000, 800,000 Bluetooth devices in total shipped. Now, every day, there are 10 million Bluetooth devices shipping. So it has grown somewhat, and it is rather ubiquitous, and it's probably worth knowing about. For you guys as web professionals in particular, there's some stuff going on that, for me, screams out opportunity for web developers. If I was thinking of setting up a business, there's some stuff in here I'm going to talk about that I'd be looking at very, very closely indeed. So, you probably associate Bluetooth with consumer stuff, consumer electronics. If you've got wireless headphones, that's the old Bluetooth, Bluetooth Classic as we used to call it. If you have an activity tracker like a Fitbit, that's Bluetooth Low Energy. There are two flavors. Bluetooth Low Energy is very optimized to run off batteries for years, very, very efficient. Perfectly reasonable to think of it as being a consumer technology. But it's actually making quite a, a significant move into the world of enterprise systems as well, for a number of reasons. Uh, who knows what a Bluetooth beacon is? Some of you, I can't see you, of course, so who, who knows? So I'm going to say lots of you. Um, Bluetooth beacons are Bluetooth devices that you can build indoor navigation systems from, so you can find your way through complex buildings when there's no GPS, or proximity-based applications. You know, you walk up to something, something happens. Very popular, absolutely being used in the world of the enterprise, places like retail. The range of Bluetooth just got a rather substantial increase as well in the latest version, which is version 5. It's now over a kilometer. Not a lot of people know that. They think it's 10 meters. It's not. That makes it fit for purpose for all sorts of requirements it wasn't before. And last year, perhaps most excitingly, in terms of opportunity, we released a new technology called Bluetooth Mesh Networking. It lets you create networks of Bluetooth devices, thousands of devices, designed to allow you to create truly smart buildings where every light, switch, thermostats, air conditioning unit is a Bluetooth node in your network, lets you control and monitor it for smart buildings, for smart industry, for all sorts of other things as well. So it's really moving into the world of enterprise applications. I have a background in enterprise systems, it so happens, and I know that for at least the last 10 years, people are not developing different native applications for the various generations of Windows that are still running around the organization with its 20,000 employees, and they're not developing special applications just for the Mac users in the marketing department, never mind the mobile workforce. You know, the browser is the platform for lots of good reasons I don't need to tell you about, but browser and enterprise, they go together. IoT, Internet of Things, it's not a buzzword. It's a very much real phenomena, and I see real examples of all the time. Bluetooth regarded as a key enabler for the IoT. The architectures are multi-tiered. Around the edge tier, you have low-power wireless communications, very often, often with sensors. That's where Bluetooth fits in. They're almost all enterprise applications, once again. And therefore, and I want you to follow this one very, very carefully, because look, it says therefore, and it says drum roll as well, because I couldn't make it play a drum roll. I think we have to conclude to meet those requirements, those enterprise requirements in a way that enterprises want, we have to have standard Bluetooth APIs in the browser. And just for good measure, by the way, QED, that makes it proof. <laughs> <laughs> it's like maths. You can't argue with me now because I said QED. Right. Moving on. So, of course, we do have web Bluetooth. You know that it exists. The current state of play, though, is this. Chrome, Google obviously have very much led the way, but even they don't have uniform support for all the blue web Bluetooth features across all the platforms that Chrome runs on. It's great on Android, on Mac, on Chrome OS. 
It's OK on Windows, but lagging in terms of functionality. You won't find it on iOS. Um, you will find it on Linux with a bit of tweaking. Samsung recently released a new version of their browser with support for Web Bluetooth without any developer flags. So thank you and well done, Samsung, for doing that. The other big three, though, not there yet. I'm in personal contact with two of them, and I can't tell you who. One of them uses the term inevitability in every conversation I have with him. The other one doesn't yet. So we'll have to wait and see where this one goes. I'm a man on a mission. I probably need your help. iOS, not for Chrome. There's a, web, uh, sorry, a, a native application you can install called WebBLE, BLE, I'm told. Gordon can tell you more. That'll let you use Web Bluetooth on an iOS device. So that's the state of play today. It's not a W3C standard. I really want it to be. What might we want to do with it? In my mind, there are basically two use cases in the world of Internet of Things if we look at it at a certain level of abstraction. I love watching the captioning. He's going to type that now. It's brilliant. <laughs> I'm remote controlling a human, and I'm going off script. Oh my god, I mustn't do this. Right, so there are two use cases, in my opinion. One I call monitoring. It's about acquiring. <laughs> <laughs> What's he typing now? <laughs> what I call monitoring, now stop laughing. <laughs> and monitoring is all about acquiring data <laughs> about devices, systems, and whole environments. And it probably involves sensors, it typically does. And control is about controlling machines and systems and environments, okay? Those are the two things, they're often used together. Can we implement web applications for those two broad use cases using web Bluetooth. Well, we can, and I'm going to try and show you live here on stage with not a little trepidation. If I was wearing a Bluetooth heart rate monitor right now, and I do own one, you would see my heart rate has just gone up, probably. So for you web developer professionals, I am not. Please don't laugh at my design, because that would upset me. In my hands here, I have a BBC Microbit. It's a microcontroller, it has Bluetooth low energy, and has a number of sensors inside it, including an accelerometer. So it measures acceleration in three directions, dimensions, relative to gravity. Watch what I do with the application, because the sequence of events you're about to see, hang on, just make sure this is ready, and yes, it is. Sequence of events you're about to see is typical. First of all, my web application has to find this thing. It's currently broadcasting small, small packets of data. That's called advertising. It's just attention-seeking. It's saying, pick me, pick me. And if I click the Scan button, which I just did accidentally, and then again, it's immediately detected. The user must select it. You can't sneakily connect to devices behind the scenes. And the user must initiate connecting to the device. You probably didn't see the letter C scroll across there because my finger is in the way. But that's the firmware on the microbit saying, hey, I've just accepted a Bluetooth connection. So discover the device, select and connect. Now we're going to interact with it. And I'm going to click a button, which will send a message over Bluetooth from the browser to tell it I want acceleration data, please. I'm going to put that down. And we have three lines, x, y, and z measurements for accelerometer, 3D space. If I pick the thing up, it gets a lot more interesting. Oh, look, how exciting is that? So that's real-time acquisition of data from sensors before your very eyes, I know you're amazed, which is great. <laughs> FYI, I started out with actually mobile applications written using Apache Cordova, so the hybrid. These are used in schools. That was tweeted this morning. I'm sharing it with you because I'm very excited. There were, those are brownies learning about Newton's laws, apparently, using the sensors in a microbit and my application to show them lines whizzing up and down, which is very cool. So that is monitoring. What about controlling? And AV team, we're about to need the camera now. So here's an electronic car. It's a kit that I built. I've enhanced it significantly, probably doubled its value with sticky tape, several elastic bands, a big wadge of blue tack, a pencil, and something I printed at home, because I'm a proper engineer, me. <laughs> <laughs> Same sequence again, scan. And make sure I select the right one. I've got two micro bits up here now, both discovered. Connect. And now I get a weird user interface. You're all laughing at I'm sure. This actually has sensors as well. Underneath, I've got digital light sensors for line following. So if I cover them up with my finger, you can see 
the microbit is reporting those sensor values in real time. If I put the thing down on the floor, probably round about there, this is going to be hilarious if this goes wrong, and use this trackball thing, if I push it, I can move it in any direction. The further from the center, the faster we go. Let's go. Look at that. It's very exciting. I can turn, usually. There we go. Let's turn fast. I can actually spin. And I can go backwards. And I should probably stop doing this, but I'm having too much fun. I'm going to be over time. I'll just skip some of the important stuff later on. So, so there you go. So monitoring. <laughs> Well, aren't you all nice? <laughs> so monitoring and control um, before your very eyes. So the fundamental capabilities are there. There are various things not implemented that are specified, but it's getting there. I want to try, in the time I've got available, and I've not got much left, um, to kind of prime you with a little bit of theory so you can go away and look at this if you're interested. Uh, and by the way, if it isn't uh, obvious, that opportunity I talked about, Smart buildings, as an example, these are truly smart connected buildings. They need sophisticated monitoring and control dashboards that you can use from the desktop or on a mobile device. Go do it. Form a company. That's what I'd do. So, theory. On a device like this, we call it a Bluetooth peripheral, there is a table of data. It's called the attribute table. The data items in that table represent some condition the device is in. I can typically read things, I can often change values. Changing a value might change the physical state of the device, like switch it on or switch it off, and so on. It's actually a hierarchy, because those data items get grouped inside things called services that just logically group things together and give us some context. The third level is to do with configuration, and we only use it occasionally, so I'll skip that for now. So services and things called characteristics, which are it's a fancy name for data items. So what can we do? Now, I've got a graphic on screen that I deliberately chose. It's actually a medical device, because I see huge potential for web Bluetooth in delivering remote healthcare. Okay, I've, got, I've got a friend with diabetes, has a Bluetooth glucose monitor. Think about, on a national scale, delivering remote healthcare services through the browser. Don't need to install anything. Collects data safely and securely. Loads of potential. What can we do? There are something like eight operations in the spec things that we can do with that table of data on the remote device that we're connected to. You probably won't ever use more than three of them. You can, of course, read values from specific data items. You'd expect that. And often, you can also write to them and change their value. And there's probably going to be a response from the device when you do that. And then we have things called notifications, where you basically say to the device once, please give me a value for this data item every time it changes or on some form of a timer. And the monitoring demo I showed you, that's what it was doing. It said, please give me accelerometer data. And it started being sent packets called notifications every 50 milliseconds or something like that. And that's what we have here, notify. <clears throat> so read, write, and notify is pretty much all you need. I've just gone too far. Back we go. Yeah. Why is this device doing that? Right. Some code, very quickly. Wow, I've got 1 minute 50. Listen carefully. So just to give you a flavor, this is what it looks like. Device discovery, the first thing I have to do, I can specify an object with some filtering criteria in it. You don't want to show the user every single Bluetooth device that's in the environment, because there could be an awful lot of them. So I've created an object here, which is going to filter on the device name, which is often included in those advertising packets. Microbits advertise a name that starts with BBC and then calling an API function, navigator Bluetooth request device, with that object as an argument. The user sees the result. They select a device, and it's only when they click the button that my promise then clause gets executed. I now have an object representing the device they selected. I can now connect to it. Connecting to it looks like that. The selected device, that's the object I just got. GAT is a technical term from the world of Bluetooth that you will encounter from time to time. Dot .connect, and now I'm connected. I'm adding an event listener, which will deal with disconnections, because I want to know when that happens. And then I'm initiating the discovery of the services and characteristics and things in that table on the device, because I want to know more about the device I've just connected to. I want to know if it supports the functions I want of it. So that looks like this. I call this get primary services function. It gives me an array of services, iterate through that array of services, and for each one I say, OK, Mr. Service, because you're a grouping mechanism, 
What characteristics do you have? And I iterate through that list of characteristics. Any that I know I'm going to work with, I store to one side. I kind of cache those data items of characteristics so I can use them later on. The kind of thing I'm going to do is kick off notifications. So in this case, one of the characteristics I stored, it's called microbit event in this code example. I call an API, func API function start notifications. It's all I need to do. My uh, then clause will fire. I register an event handler for each of the values that then starts to stream in these notification packets. And the rest, as they say, as they say is history. I don't know who they are. Now, oh, I'm over time. I want to see this as a, a W3C standard. I, I kind of think the world needs it. You probably think I'm biased, but I'm being quite genuine here. Um, I'm doing my best. I'm talking to specific product managers and R&D teams when I can. It would be great to see some support from the community, though, if you think this looks useful. And one of the ways to do that is track down the issue tracker. There they are on screen. Comment, upvote, do whatever you can if you believe it's worth doing. If you want to learn more, this is pretty much my last slide. We have some resources at Bluetooth.com. I'm behind both of them, for better or worse. Learn the fundamentals of Bluetooth low energy development. Do lots of hands-on coding, build some things with Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, all that sort of stuff, and some mobile applications. That's the Bluetooth Developer Starter Kit. Great place to start if you want to look at that stuff. If it's just web Bluetooth you want, we have the web Bluetooth tutorial. Again, it's very hands-on. You actually build something real, and you can use a micro bit, a Raspberry Pi, or an Arduino as your device. And that, my friends, is all I want to tell you. Thank you very much for listening. I don't think we have time for questions. <laughs> <coughs> right. Thank you very much for that. That was great. Um, right.